I would like to thank you for those who could join us this evening. My name is Aspen Bunyak and I am the Senior Manager of Strategic Healthcare Partnerships with Allura. We are excited to bring you this presentation from Brooke Fott, DNP, on 10 Pelvic Health Questions Women's, Women Are Afraid to Ask. Brooke Faw is the director of the Women's Institute of Sexual Health, WISH, a division of Urology Associates in Nashville, Tennessee. Brooke is widely published in the field of women's sexual and pelvic health. She regularly lectures to local, national, and international audiences and is frequently invited to provide her expert opinion to various media outlets. We do want to thank those participants who have already sent in questions by email. For questions that arise during the presentation, please feel free to submit them throughout using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will have 15 to 20 minutes following Brooke's presentation to answer your questions. Now, please welcome Brooke Fott. Thank you, Aspen. I appreciate it. Um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, bear with me while I share my slides. All right, so hopefully you guys can see everything and I trust Aspen will let me know if we encounter any technical errors. Um, so one thing I wanted to just uh, put out there really quickly is if anybody has any questions, you know, this is a pretty uh, large group, which is awesome. But if you guys have any questions, we're going to go through kind of top 10 things that I get asked both from professionals as well as, as my female patients. Um, so if you have anything specific about each individual individual topic, feel free to submit a chat. Uh, I will try to capture those as I'm talking and then Aspen is on the back end, uh, kind of navigating through those as well. And certainly we can answer things at the end, but I'm happy to kind of stop in between and elaborate upon anything that you're interested in. So tonight's topic as we discussed is sexual and pelvic health and the top 10 things that I see in my clinic and my practice that women oftentimes are a little bit scared to ask, or they think that maybe there's no treatment or they're the only one dealing with it. And so we want to kind of demystify and debunk some of these uh, concerns and also offer up some techniques as to how you as a healthcare provider can manage things. And um, if anybody's on here that's more um, a lay person that maybe isn't a healthcare provider, that maybe is tagging along, uh, maybe you'll pick up some tricks and techniques for your own sexual and pelvic health. So this is me. Um, so as stated, I'm Brooke. I'm a women's health nurse practitioner. Uh, I practice in Nashville here, and I'm the director of the Women's Institute for Sexual Health, which is a division of Urology Associates. Uh, I started this practice back in 2005 to essentially better expand upon the women's services that we provide in the urology practice, realizing that there is a big missed opportunity for treating uh, sexual and pelvic floor dysfunction in women. Uh, I've since kind of expanded into offering treatment for vulvar dermatoses or skin disorders, a uh, lot of menopause management uh, for, for certain sexual disorders such as low libido, painful sex, diminished arousal, difficulty achieving orgasm, lots of chronic pelvic pain, things like IC or interstitial cystitis, endometriosis, high tone pelvic floor, vaginismus, those sorts of things. Basically, it's a hodgepodge practice where I'm, I'm managing a lot of complicated conditions that oftentimes take a little bit more time to treat. And uh, so I, I see a lot of really interesting stuff in my practice every day. Uh, one day I'll write a book, but it has to be after I finish practicing because I'll probably lose my license. <laughs> I also, um, I lecture a lot to uh, Vanderbilt uh, University School of Nursing and School of Medicine and uh, really enjoy speaking. Unfortunately, of course, we're not getting around much. So I'm doing a lot of these virtual sessions and, uh, and really enjoy it. I enjoy connecting with my, my people across the nation and, and also internationally. So the, uh, as I mentioned, some of the conditions I treat, uh, it's, there's a lot of women's issues that are missed, unfortunately. And uh, some of that has to do with the fact that as healthcare providers, we're not, some of these topics aren't brought up in our medical training. We just don't have training on them. And a lot of times it has something to do with the fact that maybe there's not research on this topic or um, you know, maybe there's not money to be made. And so oftentimes there's not a lot of interest in certain aspects of women's healthcare. The other thing too, is it can sometimes take a bit more time than what we have allotted in our five and 10 minute office visits. And, uh, and then there's also the stigma associated with a lot of sexual and pelvic health conditions, uh, both from the provider standpoint, as well as from the patient standpoint. 
And so oftentimes we don't want to bring up certain topics because we're afraid we're going to embarrass them. We're afraid we're going to get embarrassed. Um, we don't want to offend or end up in a lawsuit. So we just avoid kind of uncomfortable to topics in many cases. But hopefully we'll, uh, we'll kind of open that up a little bit tonight and, and answer some burning questions. <laughs> So the top 10 things we're going to start with when to not tonight becomes every night. This is one of the most common things that I see in my practice is distressing low sex drive. Um, so it's very, very common despite what we might think. When we think about um, sexual dysfunction in women, we or just sexual dysfunction, we think about erectile dysfunction, which is certainly a problem associated with men or with individuals that have a penis. Um, and there's tons of research, there's tons of marketing out there, lots of different FDA approved products. So that's where, where our mind goes is, oh, sexual dysfunction is erectile dysfunction or something related to men. What we do know is that there are, is a substantially larger percentage of women that report sexual complaints compared to men. And when we break that down and we look at desire, arousal, orgasm, and sexual pain, uh, there's a, a large percentage of women more so than any other condition that report bothersome low sex drive. When we break that down even further into women that have low sex drive that are bothered by it. So not every woman will be bothered enough to seek care or that actually wants a remedy for their symptoms. For instance, I might have a couple that says, you know, my, my partner just had surgery or my partner, um, you know, has a health condition and they can't be sexually active. And we're okay with that. We've just learned other ways to be intimate and romantic. So they're not having sex and that's okay, but she admits that her libido is low. That's not a person that I'm going to treat for low sex drive. Um, but a woman that comes to see me and says, you know, I, I just kind of lost it. It's like a light switch went off um, and I'm really bothered. I feel like I've lost that connection with my partner and that spark and, and I don't have any interest in anybody outside of my marriage. It's really just, you know, the fact that my desire went away. In that case, she's bothered, she's experienced a change in her baseline sex drive. That's a situation where we call it distressing low sex drive or hypoactive sexual desire disorder or HSDD. And about 10% of US women report hypoactive sexual desire disorder or fall into the category of that. There's lots and lots of causes for it. Uh, the the Preside study was a study published not well, a while back. It was about 2008, but it's still considered a landmark survey when it comes to identifying the prevalence and the breakdown between age ages of uh, distressing low sex drive, arousal dysfunction, and orgasmic dysfunction. Um, so we're looking at not just the prevalence of these conditions, but the bother associated with it or distress. And this was a massive survey of over 31,000 women, ages 18 and up. And what they found is that distress is higher in the ages between 45 and 64. So we know that sexual problems are occur in all ages for various different reasons. It seems in different age, age categories, the rationale or the reasoning, reasoning behind their complaints shifts and changes. Um, but the distress associated with it seems to be highest in the middle age uh, range category. So 45 to 64. Some of the correlates of distressing sexual problems include poor self-assessed health, low education level, depression, anxiety, thyroid conditions, and urinary incontinence. None of those are surprising. They're all a bit unique and different, but nothing for sure is, is surprising. And as I mentioned, about 10% of US women report distressing low sex drive. Uh, when we think about the uh, sexual response model, so how does sex or how does sexual desire develop? Uh, back in uh, the 70s or early in the 60s and even in the 70s, a lot of research that occurred in sexual sexuality and sexual health involved only male subjects. And then the data was then uh, assumed to be consistent with the female sexual response. So the early linear uh, sexual response model that was published back in the 60s and early 70s was really more specific for what we understand now to be male sexual response. Sexual desire is a component of excitement that occurs before arousal. So the desire in the brain then causes physiologic arousal, blood flow and erection, um, in women, that would be blood flow into the clitoris, followed by a plateau, which is reaching the cusp of sexual excitement, orgasm, which is release of that sexual tension, and resolution, which is returning to a non-aroused state. I call that the rollover and have a cigarette phenomenon. And, uh, and it's very clean. It's very simple, simplistic response model. It's very easy to understand when there's a dysfunction associated with this. But a lot of women don't associate it with this. They, they say that their desire isn't spontaneous. It doesn't just happen. So in, in 2001, Rosemary Bassan published a, uh, a new suggestion for female response cycle per her research. 
And she found that sexual response in women tends to be a cyclical fashion or occur in a cyclical fashion. Whereas you'll see in the middle, spontaneous sex drive is certainly possible. And some women do associate with that or some occurrences uh, happen with spont spontaneity. But oftentimes a woman or an individual has to be receptive to sexual cues, whether it's uh, a compliment or flowers or, or you know, watching a romantic show or reading a, a novel or something that kind of uh, serves as sexual stimuli, they must be responsive to that. Whereas the brain processes that information in the limbic center allows the body to go, oh, something's happening, arousal occurs. This is all in the subconscious level. Then that triggers the brain to become aware that something is happening. So the, the cues come in, the brain processes it from a, a subconscious standpoint, the body responds, then the brain goes, oh, something is happening. I like that. That feels good. And I want to continue. So in that case, it's opposite in the male sexual response cycle, desire occurs first in the female sexual response cycle, uh, arousal occurs first before desire. And so desire is based upon the desire to continue in a uh, positive encounter. In addition, we see physical and emotional satisfaction and emotional intimacy that are really critical components to a satisfying uh, and enjoyable sexual encounter. Past experiences play a role in future experiences. And so we know that if a, an encounter was really positive, then a, a woman may be more motivated to uh, enter into another uh, sexual health cycle or, or, or sexuality uh, encounter in the future. Whereas if they have pain or they don't enjoy it, they don't feel that, that there's intimacy and bonding, they may kind of shut it down or not be responsive to future cues. And I know that's kind of complicated. So if anybody has any questions, let me know. Uh, the uh, psychosocial neurobiology of sexual response is really a nerdy way to kind of break down sex. We need to think about there's excitatory concept or excitatory um, uh, factors that play a role in enhancing sex drive, and there's inhibitory factors. And we'll get into this a little bit more, but uh, we need to think about this when we're kind of uh, looking at an individual and trying to figure out exactly where the problem lies. Is it due to too low of excitation? or is it due to the uh, too much inhibition? And so, and then there's certainly other factors as well too, but excitatory factors include sex steroids. And we typically think about testosterone, uh, dopamine, oxytocin, and melanocortins, and norepinephrine. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with melanocortins and we can certainly talk more about that, but uh, it's really interesting and it, it'll pop up here in just a second. So don't forget that. And then inhibitory factors include serotonin. We oftentimes think about SSRIs, our patients that are on Paxil, Prozac, Zoloft, and they report, gosh, my sex drive has declined or I can't achieve orgasm now. It's because the serotonin, while it's a fantastic mood stabilizer, it can kill sex drive. Um, and then opioids, there's a big opioid uh, uh, epidemic right now in the United States. It's ongoing. And so uh, I certainly know I have a lot of patients that, um, that, may have been or are currently on opioids that, uh, that we try to work on getting off of them in order to improve their sexual functioning. And then endocannabinoids and prolactin are certainly factors that can also play a role with the influx of um, approval of med medicinal marijuana that's something to, and also recreational marijuana. That's something to think about. Sometimes a little bit of uh, marijuana can actually help to relax an individual, but a little bit more than that, it's just like alcohol can serve as a depressant and actually shut down the sexual response cycle. And then prolactin, we think about breastfeeding moms. Uh, any woman that's breastfeeding or has hyperprolactinemia may be a, another explanation for their distressing low sex drive. Uh, one of the things that I find to be really helpful to understand how uh, sexual response works in women is uh, looking at these PET scans here. So essentially these are volunteers and we have a, a cohort of healthy volunteers that report no sexual concerns. And then we have a cohort of individuals that report or that fall into the category of HSDD or hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And when we think about excitatory versus inhibitory, it's important to keep in mind that certain aspects of the brain should light up or should become active when, uh, when watching erotic movies. So these are the excitatory aspects of the brain. On that note, we should also see other aspects of the brain shut down because we shouldn't think about the dishes and we shouldn't think about work and we shouldn't be counting the tiles on the ceiling. So there's components of the brain that really should shut down while other components activate in, in order for a healthy and um, effective sexual response. 
So here we see in the healthy volunteers that are laying in this PET scanner, uh, watching erotic movies, uh, we see some light up activity in the brain. When we look at the brain activity of an individual with HSDD, we see a substantially uh, lower level of light up activity. So toggling back and forth between those, you see that big difference. So that's pretty interesting. That's about as tangible as, of information as we can get to kind of prove that HSDD exists. Now, when we look at uh, deactivations, again, there's components of the brain that should shut down. And that's what we see in the blue. These are healthy volunteers and we see certain aspects of the brain shutting down. We don't see that in individuals with HSDD. And so the suspicion is that possibly individuals with HSDD um, either don't have enough excitation, they have too little inhibition or both. And so it's important to think that through when we think about treatment options. Uh, this is the process of care that was published through ISWISH. It is uh, open access and you can um, just simply Google process of care ISWISH. ISWISH is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. And uh, essentially there was, uh, I believe 17 uh, international experts that, that came together and we published this a few years ago with the uh, intention of individuals that may not be sex med experts to be able to follow an algorithm in order to um, uh, easily and efficiently address sexual concerns in women, specifically HSDD, and manage it in the office and or know when to refer out. So I encourage you to pull that up if you're interested or you see these patients. Currently in the United States, we have two FDA approved treatments for HSDD. That's two more than what I had five years ago, so I'm grateful for that. But when we think about uh, the medications that we have for male sexual dysfunction, we, we can probably count over 30 when we include uh, PDE5 inhibitors, that includes Viagra and Levitra, those sorts of things, testosterone products, injectables, all sorts of different products to enhance the male sexual experience. So we're way, way, way far away when it comes to uh, available treatment options. The options that we have at this point include uh, two FDA approved options, Addy and Vilesi. Addy is a pill, it's a, a 5-HT1A uh, receptor agonist and a 5-HT2 receptor, receptor antagonist, I believe I'm saying that correctly. Uh, but essentially it enhances, like in the end result, there's an enhancement of dopamine, essentially norepinephrine, and then a, a slight suppression of serotonin. Uh, it does take about eight weeks for it to work. It's a nightly pill. Biggest side effects include sleepiness, uh, kind of dizziness, and there is a bit of a, a, a caution for individuals that drink alcohol. There's not a contraindication, but rather a caution so that if an individual drinks more than, uh, I think, two or three alcoholic beverages in one night, just don't take their pill that night because it does act on the central nervous system. Uh, but about 50% of women that take this product will have a substantial sexual response. And I see that in my clinical practice too, maybe a little bit higher of a percentage, I think, because I really weed out the patients I think that will respond well. I don't want them to take something for eight weeks if I don't think it's really going to work for them. Uh, but the women that it works for, it's really a profound result. And then if they have, end up stopping it for whatever reason, it's like, again, this light switch just goes right back off. Uh, Vilesi is the newest member of the, the HSDD team, and that was approved just a couple years ago. It's an, inject, an auto injector. Um, it has the active medication within it, so no need to draw it up. It's subcutaneous, very tiny needle. Uh, it's auto administered by the, the individual, works within about 45 minutes, and can last upwards of 16 hours of, or so, depending upon uh, the individual and their metabolism, of course. Um, I've even had patients tell me it lasts the entire day. So that's kind of a nice benefit too. But anyway, a lot of women are concerned about, you know, do I, do I want to do an injection before sexual, sexual, or a sexual encounter? It seems like it kind of kills the mood, but it's, uh, it's about 45 minutes ahead of time. So it's really not in the moment of it. And it really is pretty pain-free. I haven't had anybody complain to me about the, the injection site discomfort, the biggest side effect of this is nausea it occurs in about 40% uh, of women that use it. It tends to be really mild though. And it's usually for whatever reason, only with the first injection. So after that first injection, usually the, the rate of nausea substantially decreases or kind of eradicates. And, um, and individuals that did have nausea, it was usually pretty mild and transient. So I oftentimes will tell my patients, just use the first injection at bedtime. And if you have any side effects, you sleep it off. We also have Restella that's on the off-label list here. That's a supplement that can be taken daily to enhance blood flow into the pelvic floor. It works on the, um, the uh, Viagra pathway, the nitric oxide pathway. Again, takes anywhere from like four to six weeks for it to really activate. 
Um, but because it's not working on the central nervous system, it's a unique kind of mechanism of action. It can be used with some of these other products. Uh, and I don't think I mentioned that Vilesi, I apologize, is a melanocortin receptor agonist. And by, uh, by using an agonist of the melanocortin receptors, you're essentially enhancing dopamine. So both Phylisi and Addy work on the central nervous system. Whereas again, the Ristella that you see in that purple there works more so on the blood vessels and dilating blood vessels, enhancing blood flow. Before some of these products came out, I used a lot of bupropion off-label because again, it has a pretty uh, dopaminergic effect. Sometimes we'll use testosterone. And if you look at the process of care that I mentioned earlier through ISWISH, we found that testosterone really only tends to make a difference in postmenopausal women. So younger women, I do not tend to um, utilize much testosterone, but it's certainly a consideration. And there are a couple of, or there's a clinical trial, hopefully about to begin a phase three trial on testosterone and sildenafil versus testosterone and bupropion. One of them with the sildenafil is to, uh, or is for women with low sensitivity to sexual cues. And the testosterone bupropion is for individuals with overactive inhibition. So they need to kind of taper down that inhibition a little bit. So it's an interesting concept to mesh the sex steroid with a CNS acting medication. All right, and then stimulants. For some women, their brain just doesn't shut off. They're, they have almost an ADD tendency when they're in a sexual act. And so use of off-label use of things like Adderall or Ritalin or something of that nature, uh, just the short acting, you don't wanna do an extended release, but using that a few hours before sex, as long as it's not too late in the day, can sometimes help with focus. And then certainly non-medicinal interventions, I oftentimes refer out for sex therapy. I suggest erotic reading and meditation, um, basically whatever kind of gets that, that individual's blood flowing. Okay, number two, I cannot tell you how many patients I receive simply because of uh, contact irritation from products that they uh, used that we were hoping would, or that they hoped would help a symptom or make them smell better or whatever that might be, and ended up causing a complication or um, a, a skin reaction. I'm actually going to quickly take, um, uh, somebody's asking about pellets for, whoops, sorry about that. Somebody's asking about pellets for uh, testosterone, I believe it was. And I personally don't do pellets with testosterone. I mostly just do, like if I'm gonna use testosterone, I'll use a topical cream. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to make this go away. Okay, going back to number two. Um, so products used in the vagina. One thing to keep in mind is pretty much the entire feminine hygiene aisle is packed with products that women should not use. <laughs> so there's a lot of ingredients in the feminine hygiene products that can uh, irritate, that can be a caustic aggravant to the, the sensitive vaginal mucosa. It can tamper with the, um, the healthy vaginal pH, which the vagina is an open cavity. It is acidic in order to fight off and ward off uh, things that may get up inside that cavity. So it's one of the few parts of the human body in which we want it to be very acidic. Uh, there's certain bacteria that thrive in that environment that maintain that healthy ecosystem. And when a disruption occurs, whether it's the introduction of a, a caustic agent or inflammation or whatnot, that completely shifts things and it can cause tissue changes, irritation, it can cause infection, all sorts of complications and problems. Ironically, we still walk down these aisles and we see perfumed this and you know spray this and so forth. Um, so looking over this list, it's kind of a trick question because honestly, in my opinion, a woman should never use a perfume in their vagina. They shouldn't use uh, chemical based arousal oils and things of that nature. Even Monistat, believe it or not, even though it's specifically designed for vaginal use, um, you know, some women, it works just fine. They have no problems, but other women, the preservatives that are in there and the alcohol in the base can really, really aggravate them and cause, um, side effects. And then as a joke, Lysol, haha. however, <laughs> In years past, um, Lysol was actually marketed, not just used, but marketed as a vaginal douche. And if you see here on the left, this uh, advertisement, this is an actual ad that was published. I think, I want to say it was like in the 1920s or 30s or so. And basically it's showing this, this woman, it says a perfect wife until 6 p.m. And it's insinuating that she's a good mother, a good housekeeper, uh, a good hostess, a good cook, but you know what? When her husband comes home, her vagina stinks. So therefore, let's put Lysol in your vagina. And it's horrifying to think that women not only 
did this, but they were encouraged to, to do this. And if you didn't, you were a bad, bad wife, you know? Um, and this is unfortunately something that has been continuously handed down this suggestion. I can't tell you, I, women don't oftentimes offer up that they're using Lysol douches, but I've had maybe five women over the past 15 years of my practice that uh, intermittently will use a Lysol douche. And, and I see them back and they come in with red inflamed tissue. So I have to do a lot of education with these women because again, this has been something that's suggested for a long, long time. So this is certainly not something you will see a lot more than likely. However, uh, you will see women using products that, that probably are not ideal or they're using products because they think that they have an odor or discharge is bad or whatnot. So it's important for women to understand that discharge is actually normal. The vagina is a self-cleaning oven. And so it's continuously cleansing itself out and trying to uh, discharge its way through to a, a healthy return to a vaginal ecosystem. Uh, some personal care that I share with my patients, as I mentioned, it's a self-cleaning oven. Uh, so discharge is normal. It's the vagina self-cleaning. There's no need um, to, you know, again, use perfumes and douches and things of that nature, unless it's medically indicated. So that sometimes in a once in a blue moon, I might suggest a hydrogen peroxide douche, maybe to a patient that's wearing a pessary or something of that nature. But in general, I try to avoid douching with my patients. Uh, no self-treating. Oftentimes women inaccurately diagnose themselves. They think they have a yeast infection and it's BV, or they think they have BV and they don't have any problem. So in that case, uh, it's important that they seek care from somebody that can examine them, if it's you or you know somebody else in their healthcare team, uh, to appropriately diagnose them so that they treat, they receive appropriate treatment if necessary. Glycerin-free lubricants. Glycerin is a component of a ton of different uh, common lubricants, such as KY and Astroglide. And while a lot of women can tolerate that just fine, glycerin can dry out tissue, ironically. It's great for the company because then you have to keep using the product. However, uh, for women that are more sensitive or already have some underlying dryness, it can actually worsen the underlying issue. No harsh scrubbing or soaps. It's important that women use more natural-based products uh, to prevent further drying out. And then even hygiene products, uh, toilet paper, pads, tampons, even uh, uh, continence pads and diapers oftentimes are chlorinated and bleached to make them a real pretty white color. And so it's important that you find product lines. And I know, I think seventh generation, and there's a couple other product lines that are chlorine and bleach free. It's really, really critical for individuals that are more sensitive. And then coconut oil, it's a great vaginal moisturizer. So a moisturizer has, uh, tends to have smaller molecules that absorbs into skin, whereas a lubricant has larger molecules that sits on skin and prevents friction during two skin surface, uh, surfaces that are touching. So I tell patients, use coconut oil or something like that to kind of massage into the tissue, perfectly safe and fine in the vagina, and then use a dab of a glycerin-free lubricant at the point of penetration, and it will, will really minimize any uh, irritation and dryness that a woman may experience. And then I also give out just a list that includes a lot of these components, but just a list with these suggestions on it. So my patients go home, they only hear so much. And when you send them with the list, they go, oh, okay, that's what she said. Okay, I'm gonna go find that product. And it really helps to facilitate compliance. Some known vulva irritants, as I mentioned, the pads and panty liners, toilet paper, uh, those wipes, those wipes drive me crazy. I see so many women that have irrita irritation and burns because those wipes oftentimes have alcohol in them, but they're designed to keep you clean. And so uh, if a woman's gonna use some type of peri wipe or uh, wipe after a bowel movement, just make sure it's as natural as possible. And there are products over the counter that are like that. Soaps, I love this product called, um, oh, it's called Shea Moisture, S-H-E-A Moisture. And there's a bar soap that's designed for babies with eczema and it's great. It doesn't seem to irritate a lot of my patients. And so I just tell them, go get that off of Amazon or go to Target or whatnot. And then anti-anesthetic anti agents, oftentimes benzocaine uh, containing um, creams and products will topically numb or help symptoms very temporarily, but they can cause a caustic irritation. So when I went through training eons ago on vulvar dermatology, it was imprinted in my brain that benzocaine will give you pain. Uh, so benzocaine will give you pain. Keep that in mind if there's one thing to take away today. Uh, lubricants, as I mentioned, just be careful of glycerin and even parabens and the alcohol base that's in creams, certain products that you, you, that you might prescribe for vaginal use. If it's also used for oral mucosa, make sure it doesn't have a peppermint base to it. We've had that issue in the past. We've talked about the sprays and douches. Certainly if a woman is sensitive to latex, I try to just avoid latex at all costs in my practice. 
and adhesives and as, as I joked earlier, the Lysol. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so I'll address the, um, the question about bioidentical hormones here at the end, because I think I'm gonna talk a little bit more about hormones here shortly. And if I don't, I'll get to it at the end. Okay, so oral birth control um, prevents pregnancy by killing your libido and drying out the vagina. Uh, and I like to you know, be a little bit dramatic, but obviously most women that take birth control pills are totally fine. They don't have complications or issues to their sexual functioning. However, we do know that there are some sexual implications for women that use long-term birth control pills. So this is a, a little uh, a diagram or a chart here that shows you that in the first column, you see continued users of oral contraceptives. The second column, you see discontinued users. And in the third column, it's never users. And what we see is that women who have never been on uh, oral contraceptives have a, a much higher uh, testosterone. They have a much lower sex hormone binding globulin, which is a protein that latches onto testosterone and renders it useless. And uh, also they have a higher calculated free testosterone. So this is interesting. It's something to consider for patients that uh, maybe are trying to decide between different, uh, different contraceptive agents and may already be high risk for sexual dysfunction or already complain of sexual disorders. And I know that this is a whole topic in and of itself, but um, you can see here that there's quite a few publications. These are some of the earlier publications that have been expanded upon in recent literature. Uh, this is also basically just demonstrating that testosterone levels decline, uh, not just the total testosterone, but how much is unbound to that protein and actually bioavailable to function within the woman's body. Uh, the longer a woman is on an oral contraceptive agent, the worse the situation seems to be. And knowing that testosterone does drive sexual functioning for both men and women, this just makes sense why it can lead to sexual disorders such as low sex drive and arousal and orgasmic dysfunction. In addition, oral contraceptives have been connected with a change or a mutation in hormone receptors within the vulvar uh, and uh, basically the whole urogenital tissue. And so that can lead to sexual uh, dryness and pain. Some of the labs I might draw, I oftentimes don't draw labs in my office unless there's a specific reason. So I don't want you to think that every woman that comes in gets blood work. However, if I do need to draw labs, if for some reason I think they need a, a testosterone panel, these are some of the labs I might draw, including uh, testosterone as well as dihydrotestosterone. It's the more activated uh, uh, version or more active version in the human body compared to total testosterone. And then as I mentioned earlier, that protein sex hormone binding globulin, uh, if I suspect maybe a woman has hyperprolactinemia or I want to rule that out, I'll check that and maybe even a thyroid panel. Uh, if I'm not sure about their menopausal status, I might check an FSH. Uh, so this is also looking at at some additional hormone levels in uh, healthy premenopausal women. And there's also publications looking at postmenopausal women as well. But it, for the sake of time, I just included one example. You can certainly look this up. It was from Andre Gay, G-U-A-Y. This first publication was in 2004. Uh, but again, basically what you see is uh, the, throughout the age or throughout the lifespan, testosterone declines between 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49. So as I mentioned earlier, when we're talking about testosterone, um, oftentimes um, when a woman hits menopause, she experiences a decline in her circulating estrogen and progesterone, but she's also then dealing with lower levels of, of testosterone. So that's why we see in postmenopausal women, testosterone plays a key role. However, a woman, a younger woman on oral contraceptives may have a postmenopausal like level. And so in that case, we need to either get them off of the contraceptive agent and switch them to something else that may not have the same effect or potentially even play with um, a low potency dosing, which is certainly off label. All right, sex is a risk factor for recurrent UTIs. Gosh, this is one of the most maddening things I see in my practice. Working in urology, uh, this is very common. It meshes the two uh, things that I treat, which is sexual disorders and um, urologic conditions. But there are definitely methods to minimize um, uh, recurrent UTIs. We do know that the female urethra is much shorter than the male urethra at five centimeters compared to 22 centimeters. And during intercourse, there's a direct hit to the urethra. Um, so oftentimes, especially in a woman who maybe has a more narrow introitus, uh, maybe less elasticity, less lubrication, there's going to be more of a direct impact on that uh, urethral tissue. And so bacteria can get shoved up inside there. 
So that's why we tend to see more, uh, more frequent UTIs in women compared to men and also women after they become sexually active. So considerations, postcoital void. So after an, a woman is, is done being sexually active, whether it's with herself or with a partner, just try to urinate just to get any um, extra urine out of the bladder. Avoid scrubbing the vulva and application of harsh soaps and chemicals. I have a lot of women that think that because they're getting these infections, they're dirty. So they're scrubbing themselves. I've had women sit in bleach baths, like what you hear for people with MRSA, uh, just really harsh things that can worsen the situation and, and predispose them to more frequent infections. Uh, proper water intake, treat skin disorders of the vulva appropriately, and even a cranberry supplement. Uh, so for anybody that's familiar with the company that's sponsoring our, our uh, talk tonight, uh, there is a fantastic cranberry supplement, which I'm going to show you here in a second. Uh, but the American Neurological Association uh, in their um, published guidelines, they do acknowledge that cranberry at the bottom there under the non-antibiotic prophylaxis can, it is an appropriate uh, treatment. It's a non-antibiotic treatment to help prevent recurrent bladder infections. And I use this product in my female patients of all ages, and it's been a miracle. I just had a gal the other day, I was telling one of the, the people from this, this company that she told me, she goes, you know what? Allura has been the best thing that's happened to me through this entire year. And it just kind of made me laugh because, I mean, it's not saying much because 2020 sucks, but, <laughs> but it, it was a pretty powerful statement. So this is Elora. Um, it is a, a very, very powerful, potent, uh, high quality cranberry supplement. It is a medical grade cranberry supplement to say that as well. Um, and it's, it's got 36 pack for, or 36 milligrams of pack for anybody that's not familiar with that. That's the, uh, essentially the measurement of the, um, the cranberry juice concentrate or the extract. Now you'll see if you look at uh, products over the counter, and I see this all the time where I'll look at a shelf and you see all these different products and they look very similar. They might have the same dosing or one might actually seem like it has a higher uh, a milligram of the, the pack. And you think, well, gosh, this one either is cheaper, it has more in it, or maybe it, it has a higher milligram. But what I've learned is that, um, and this is over the past five years or so, not only looking at the data, but also my patient experience, they're not all created the same. And I think we've all experienced that with various supplements. Unfortunately, there's very little regulation with supplements. And so uh, pretty much anybody can throw whatever they want in a bottle and call it what they want. And that's where we see a lot of the kind of comp competitors of these supplements, but they're filled with garbage or they're, the process of them is really poor and it leads to a really poor, uh, ineffective product. And that's kind of what we see with other cranberry supplements. And I always wondered, you know, gosh, I, I don't really see a lot of effectiveness with um, uh, some of these other cranberry products. So I kind of got away from cranberry products for a while years ago. And then I found Allure again and, and really started uh, um, suggesting this to my patients consistently. And I've seen a tremendous improvement in my patients. I probably recommend this three or four times a day. Um, I have a quick little video. I'm going to see if I can get this bad boy to work. <clears throat> hmm. It was working before. Bear with me. Well, okay. So, so the video essentially is, uh, you can look at it on the Allura website, but the reason I really liked it, not only does it support the things I just mentioned about how uh, uh, what cranberry is and the difference between the different products, but it acknowledges the fact that, um, that the bacteria that, uh, that cause bladder infections, they have these finger-like projections. And this is what I tell my patients. They have these finger-like projections and they embed into the wall of the bladder. So as they embed into the wall of the bladder, it allows them to, to connect to the mucosa, begin an inflammatory response, and then mute or not mutate, they can mutate, but replicate into a, a full-fledged infection. And as that's happening, the bladder becomes inflamed, breaks in the bladder wall occur, and that's what causes toxic urine to seep through and aggravate the deeper layers. So that's why we see frequency, urgency, dysuria, blood in the urine. Uh, it's a pretty miserable experience for women experiencing this. Well, cranberry comes along and essentially coats those finger-like projections and prevents the, the fingers of the bacteria to adhere into the bladder wall the way that they used to. So essentially they just get flushed out. 
It's a very, very effective process. It's been proven uh, repeatedly to work. And uh, so I encourage you, if you have any patients experiencing recurrent UTIs, to, uh, to look into Allura. Uh, and that's the only one I use at this point. I have lots of products I used to suggest in the past, but I've really kind of um, only, I've, I've become very specific about encouraging my patients to get Allura. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll get back to some of these questions again here at the end. Okay, so sex doesn't have an expiration date. And th what this is referencing is older couples. I just the other day had a woman who is 96 or seven years old that is in some type of assisted living community. And she just found herself a 55 year old boyfriend. So yay to her. She's one of the most youthful 90 something year olds that I see in my practice. But um, it just made me laugh because you just, you can never, ever assume. I have 40 somethings in my practice that tell me that ship is sailed. They're not sexually active anymore because they feel like they're too old, which is total poppycock. Um, but then I also have lots and lots of older couples that find it very, very important and as it should be. So there really is not a time period that we should assume or expect our patients to stop being sexually active. And it's really important that we keep that in mind when uh, not introducing our own bias into uh, our assumptions into our patient visits. So make sure you include that in your, your health history, asking, do you have any sexual concerns or explaining that sometimes as women enter into menopause in the years after, or uh, when partners begin to age, there's complications that can occur with sexuality. Do you have any questions for me? And you know, if it's not really your, your groove and you're not super comfortable asking those questions, at least identifying on paperwork that there might be a concern and finding a way to refer out is uh, really important. There's a lot of research on that. We just unfortunately don't have time to dive into it. So I want to give you a quick little snippet on that. All right, and then this is the fun one. Um, sexual aids and toys are simply physical therapy for the vagina <laughs> or the vulva or the, the pelvic floor. All right, so this is where we get into some fun examples of different toys and items and what they do and what to consider for patients that may have sexual complaints. Um, this is a picture of, would you say it's pain or arousal and orgasm? They kind of look the same, huh? So um, here we'd see some pumps and vacuum devices. The Eros device was the first thing to ever be approved for sexual dysfunction in the United States. Uh, it was approved back in 2001. And I remember when it first came out, I thought, I will never recommend that. That's so weird. Um, and it was also very expensive. However, they had really impressive data. So it didn't unfortunately take off all that well. And it kind of fell by the wayside. It's made a, a comeback. Um, I believe it's like 200 to $300 now. And it, I think initially it was about 500. So it's an improvement. It's not covered by insurance, but essentially it's got a little suction device that stimulates the clitoris and enhances blood flow into the genitals. There's some devices that are um, a little bit cheaper, excuse me, over the counter. We've got the womanizer device. I did not name that. I, um, I kind of giggle when I say that. It's kind of a, a terrible name. <laughs> it's a German based company. Uh, and it's got a, a patented airflow technology, but it really is a phenomenal uh, uh, mechanism of action. So instead of it just suction, it doesn't suction, it has this airflow system on top of vibration and women tend to really give positive reports with it. And then there's other like sucking vibrators and things like that that can be bought on Amazon and pretty much any other uh, website that sells products like this. Amazon, of course, sells everything. So you'll see a lot of these devices are on Amazon. Some of them are more specific companies, such as Dame is a female-led uh, company that offers uh, products that are designed for enhancing the female sexual experience. But it's really important, I think, to destigmatize. Like our first inclination when, when this, this slide pops up is to go, you know, oh my gosh, you know, I hope my kids aren't watching. And by the way, I hope none of you have <laughs> your kids around. Uh, when I was actually developing the slide, funny story, my uh, nanny happened to walk in, I happened to be at home, and she walked in on me just as my, my computer froze right on the slide. And so it was slightly awkward, but it was a good experience in trying to destigmatize and explain, you know, what I was doing and the importance of this. Well, a lot of women, especially, you know, if there have been any, let's say, spinal cord injuries or changes in um, older age or changes in uh, sensation of the, the pelvic floor or the vagina, oftentimes respond really well to vibration. So there's no reason to not look at this really as physical therapy uh, or sexual physical therapy or pelvic floor physical therapy. Uh, and all these products, they come in different shapes and sizes and costs. So uh, just taking maybe some of these websites and sharing them with patients can be quite helpful. 
All right, nipple stimulation. The, uh, I was actually trying to find a slide earlier that talks through some of the erogenous areas of the body. It's not just the genitals. And that's really important, especially for women that have pain or women, I have a lot of women with spinal cord injuries that have lost sensation either entirely or partially. And there's other parts of the body that can be stimulated with aids and toys. So here's some examples. All right, and I tend to talk a lot and I'm running kind of short on time. So I'm gonna kind of speed through these last few and then we'll do some questions. But physical therapy is a really critical component to my practice. And it's really important to consider it for pelvic floor disorders. Um, I have a fantastic network of physical therapists in my area. And a lot of them you can find through apta.org. It's the American Physical Therapy Association. They have a find a physician or a physical therapist on their website. So you can click on their link, type in women's health, and you'll find somebody that practices women's health. Uh, I encourage you to meet your local physical therapist so you can tell your patients what to expect and just let them know, hey, I know this person. They're really cool. They're nice. Or I've had, had good experience in the past because sending somebody to pelvic floor PT when they might actually work through the vagina uh, is a little bit intimidating for somebody who's never thought about, thought about some type of therapy like that. Uh, in Europe, this is very, very widely used. Women after uh, giving birth, oftentimes, I think it's in France, they get government sponsored six weeks of pelvic floor PT. So it's very, very common. It's just here in the US, it's one of these like stigma things, uh, but it's really incredibly, incredibly helpful for women with um, uh, pelvic pain, sexual pain, urinary incontinence, uh, even decreased sensation sometimes, just enhancing that blood flow can really help. And then also not just leakage, but also other voiding disorders, constipation, that sort of thing. World of, of difference with, um, with those patients. And then urinary leakage. Uh, I see a lot of patients with urinary incontinence. However, women that say, I only leak when I'm super aroused during sexual activity or with orgasm, it may not be leakage. I actually had a patient uh, years ago, it was right after I started my practice, that um, reported this type of phenomenon and she ended up pursuing a sling with a, a physician outside my practice and she came to me because she was devastated that she no longer had uh female ejaculation and, and i think i said that wrong she had some leakage so she got the sling but then she also could not ejaculate and it was really bothersome because she found it to be very uh um it was it was a really pleasurable sensation for her to have this ejaculation uh, but it's been found initially, we thought it was only about 10%, but in, in uh, more recent publications, upwards of 70% of women report at least an intermittent experience with release of fluids similar to male ejaculate during intense arousal and orgasm. It's suspected that this is released from the skein's glands, which are just to the side, just lateral of the urethra as shown in this diagram below. Um, and in some studies, it's been identified that there's possible PSA or pros prosthetic specific antigen. <laughs> It's late in the day, can't remember all the words, uh, or prostate specific antigen, uh, which is obviously something that we see in semen out of men. So there's a suspicion that maybe the skein's glands are analogous or somehow similar uh, derivatives of the prostate gland, but we don't have a clear consensus on that. And then pain with sex is never normal, and we do have lots and lots of treatments for the various causes of sexual pain, which include high tone pelvic floor dysfunction, which is different from those uh, patients with vaginismus. If you've ever heard of the term vaginismus, we think tightness of the muscle. But what that is, is if you go to examine somebody with vaginismus, you put in one finger in the vaginal canal, the muscles clamp down, that's vaginismus. If a woman is uh, tolerant of an exam and you, you put your finger in, you're doing an exam, and they just they, they seem really tense just in general, they're not having a spasm, but just tension and tenderness. It's kind of like sitting at a computer and then you kind of rub your back and you feel knots in your shoulders. The same thing can happen inside the vagina in the, in the pelvic floor. And those are trigger spots associated with high tone pelvic floor dysfunction. It's very similar treatments, but oftentimes uh, a different set of circumstances. So women that have trauma, whether it's just chronic pain or they've uh, you know, had a bad, bad sexual encounter, they've been raped or whatnot. Oftentimes we see vaginismus associated with that, but not always. So don't always assume somebody with vaginismus has a history of sexual trauma. It could be as simple as, you know, they're a really intense athlete. They started having pain when they tried to use tampons and that led them to be, um, to have an involuntary spasm with penetration of anything. Uh, atrophic vaginitis, the new term is genitourinary syndrome of menopause. 
lichen sclerosis is a skin disorder that is a precancerous uh, condition and lots of other causes of pain. I mean, this is only a, a tiny sample of some of the possibilities, uh, but pudendal nerve impingement, endometriosis, interstitial cystitis, and uh, some various other things. So a couple of things I wanted to list here. This is again, most certainly not all inclusive, but vaginal skin conditions of involver dermatoses that I see in my practice that can impact comfortable penetrative play as well as external play. Uh, any type of dermatitis, eczema, lichen simplex chronicus, those are all pretty similar conditions. Lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, all these sound similar, but their background is oftentimes quite different. Also lichen sclerosis is precancerous, whereas the others are not considered precancerous. Uh, psoriasis, uh, hydradenitis superativa is a nightmare of a condition. Hopefully you guys don't ever see that, but more than likely you will. They get these really deep um, pits inside the armpits and the groin. Uh, seborrheic dermatitis, bichettes, and plasma cell vulvitis, all these inflammatory, irritating conditions can really certainly impact healthy and comfortable sexual functioning. When in doubt, uh, vulvoscopy and biopsy, it's really important to make sure that you're trained uh, to use a colposcope to examine the, the vulva and the external tissue. And always, always biopsy if you're not quite sure what it is to make sure that you rule out any type of malignancy or precancerous condition. For women with postmenopausal uh, atrophy or genitourinary syndrome of menopause, we have local estrogens like creams and pills and rings. We have um, oral products that act like estrogen, but are not. They're called CIRMs, a selective estrogen receptor modulator. We have CO2 lasers or fractional CO2 lasers uh, with published data and efficacy. And then some alternative options, things like coconut oil and emuate is an over-the-counter cream, which can be soothing. Hyaluronic acid has been shown to um, improve the integrity of vulvar and vaginal tissue. And then sometimes even using injections to kind of uh, numb, but also reduce inflammation and then manually massage out the tightness of the vaginal introitus to improve comfortable penetration. For vestibulodynia, women that have chronic vulvar pain, oftentimes it's idiopathic. We don't have an unknown cause. Uh, could it be related to oral contraceptives? There's a, a link with that, as I mentioned earlier. Using topical lidocaine sometimes can be helpful, but usually needs to be consistent to consistently deaden that, uh, that tissue and reduce the pain signal. Local estrogen and testosterone creams can be helpful in some cases, and that's the mixture that I use in my practice. It's an estradiol 0.03 and testosterone 0 .0, or 0 0.1 uh, is great for vulvar tissue. Make sure you don't put a 1% testosterone on the vulva because it can cause clitoromegaly. It's a 0.1%. Capsaicin cream is not for somebody that's inflamed. It's only for that idiopathic vulvodynia with no visible changes. Uh, capsaicin, of course, is a derivative of hot peppers, but it's been shown to exhaust that pain signal when used consistently for up to three months. It's not the most pleasant, so you have to warn patients ahead of time. Atropine cream can sometimes reduce irritation and inflammation. As I mentioned, sometimes intralesional injections or, or pelvic floor injections, gabapentin, amitriptyline, and even surgery in more severe cases. And then pelvic floor dysfunction, as we talked about some of these conditions earlier, vaginismus versus high tone pelvic floor. Treatment with pelvic floor PT is almost always critical. Vaginal dilation, here's some websites you can purchase dilators. I oftentimes will prescribe Valium or diazepam and or baclofen suppositories. It really helps to relax that, that pelvic floor muscle directly without causing a systemic impact. And then as we mentioned, or as I mentioned earlier, trigger point injections with either uh, steroids, Botox, or even homeopathic mixtures that have been shown to uh, relax the pelvic floor and reduce inflammation. All right, last but not least, pubic hair. I love to end on pubic hair. It is not the enemy. Uh, but oftentimes, if you do pelvic exams, you see a wide variety of shapes and, uh, and grooming patterns. And I've, I always joke, I say, I feel like I could tell somebody's age. If you give me like 20 pictures of uh, the groin region and I know nothing about them, <laughs> I oftentimes can guess the, uh, the age category uh, of the woman. So the purpose of pubic hair has been uh, found to be related to sexual attraction. There Maybe there's pheromones within the pubic hair that attract a partner, probably more so in like older days, caveman days, that sort of thing, uh, but protection of the vaginal cavity. So for instance, uh, you think about a, a human that might be like without clothing and uh, crouched over a, a you know dirt floor, 
things can get up inside the vagina, but if you've got that wild array of hair that's covering it, it's a little bit of a safety net. <laughs> and then cushioning during uh, vigorous sex has also been a proposed purpose for pubic hair. Um, so if you think about uh, uh, vigorous sex and direct contact repeatedly, flesh on flesh can cause friction irritation and, irrit and, um, and bruising. But if you have a little extra padding from pubic hair on both the male and female, female partner or female and female, it definitely can buffer that a little bit. Uh, in the 70s, there was a big rise in porn conception, and that's when we started to see removal and shaping of pubic hair. Uh, to date, we see in a couple of surveys of upwards of almost 100%, so like 90, 95% of college-age students report some type of partial or complete removal of pubic hair, and that's both men and women. Uh, and about 2% of women over 40 report pubic hair removal, and that's total hair removal, so a much lower percentage. Um, I have seen a, a switch recently where some of my much younger patients, like late teens, early 20s, uh, have gone back to either not removing hair or minimally removing hair. So it's been kind of interesting. I also see women wearing bell bottoms, and it's just interesting to see the transition over the, over the decades. 50% uh, of women that remove pubic hair uh, may experience complications. It's really common. And these complications really are not major, as you can imagine. Abrasions, burns, ingrown hair. So they're not going to die from removing their pubic hair. Women oftentimes ask me, as well as my colleagues, should you remove hair? What, what method is the best uh, method? I've definitely seen women that, you know, tear their skin or cut themselves or burn themselves with some of these various uh, um, options. There really isn't one that's better than the other. So as long as they know what they're doing, ideally use a, an experienced professional. <laughs> that's the ideal circumstance. Uh, <clears throat> but these are some of the patterns we might see. Uh, the arrow, the Charlie Chaplin, the uh, rising sun, the lightning bolt, the landing strip, the heart. I've seen tattoos and piercings and things to make this even more elaborate. And I say, you know what, to each his own based on the research. All right, so I apologize. As I said, I tend to be long-winded and I didn't leave much time. Uh, Aspen, I am fine staying on a bit longer to answer any questions. Um, <laughs> but of course, if anybody needs to get off or whatnot, I wanna be sensitive to your time. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. That was fabulous. We do have, I think, a couple questions sitting in the Q&A, and I have about four that were sent in via email uh, before mm -hmm. the presentation. Um, mm -hmm. So we can run through the Q&A ones first, if you want to, that were submitted tonight. Um, mm -hmm. First is, I see premenopausal women coming in with low libido who are who have been to bioidentical hormone clinics and have no improvement. Do you see that a lot? Yeah, I think some of those clinics, and I don't want to speak for all of them, but unfortunately, there's a lot of these pop-up clinics where, um, you know, there it's kind of like a, a, a one and done. Everybody comes in, they get the same treatment. It's not individualized, like they claim. They say oh, it's individualized. No, really, everybody kind of gets the same thing. They spend an enormous amount of money. Um, now, with that being said, there are um, safe and appropriate clinics too, but unfortunately there's been a bad rap with the ones that don't really follow uh, appropriate standards. They're really just kind of bringing people in and just trying to make a buck. All that being said, patients that uh, may not experience symptom improvement, whatever their symptom is, let's say it's low libido, it may be because it's not a hormone-based issue. Maybe they need a product that is going to work more so on the central nervous system. Maybe they hate their partner. Maybe they have sexual pain. So that's where I think it's important to look at all the possibilities and do a comprehensive assessment versus just relying upon a, a hormone replacement. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, do you see similar effects on testosterone and SHBG levels with all CHC methods or only COC? Yeah. So the question is related to combined hormonal contraceptives versus oral. So I think the reference is to, you know, like vaginal ring and patch and that sort of thing. In years past, I actually switched everybody to the uh, Nuva ring, thinking that that would be a better approach. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, even the patch. And what we found is that there was this, a very similar phenomenon, if almost worse. Uh, so that was kind of uh, confusing. Um, what we think now is it has more so to do with the type of hormone as well as the amount. And so uh, pretty much the only really good uh, hormonal treat or uh, hormonal contraceptive agents, and when I say good, that's terrible language, <laughs> that don't tend to have uh, sexual side effects are IUDs 
And even, you know, like the depo and even like next one on sometimes the type of progestin used can at the amount that it's used at can also have its own array of sexual side effects, which makes things a little bit tricky. So IUDs tend to be a pretty safe approach, including the progestin IUDs, because it's a low potency, it's a localized uh, progestin, more so compared to the injection and in, um, in the ring. Uh, the newer ring doesn't seem to have any evidence to show uh, sexual side effects. And we're excited about that. I don't have a ton of clini clinical experience yet, but we believe that maybe if that holds true, it may be related to the fact that the progestin in the ring, in the new ring, Anavera, um, has, uh, it's derived from progesterone, which is the first progestin on the market to be derived from progesterone. So that's exciting. Thank you. Um, do you use postcoital antibiotic prophylaxis or has Allura replaced that for your patients with recurrent postcoital UTIs? Yeah, I certainly use um, postcoital antibiotic prophylaxis or even just like a daily low potency antibiotic. However, I do encourage trying Allura for, uh, for my patients first if they're willing to give it a try. And keeping in mind that I work in urology, but patients oftentimes come to me because uh, they're trying, they want alternative options. They don't want to have to take an antibiotic all the time. And I, I was just as shocked as my patients, but I have seen patients do just as well, if not better with the Allura. And I think part of it probably has to do with better compliance, better tolerance. Um, women are more, more comfortable endorsing something like a cranberry supplement than maybe a, uh, an antibiotic. And so there's a couple of different reasons for that, but um, you know, it's not foolproof. It's not going to treat every patient. It's not going to prevent uh, UTIs in all patients. But from my experience and based on the data that we have, it's a totally valid and appropriate uh, uh, treatment, even if you haven't yet tried antibiotic therapy. And that's also supported by the AUA. Okay. Uh, what's on your list of recommended lubricants? Okay. Uh, my lubricant, my lubricants that I suggest would be um, slippery stuff. That's actually what I use in my clinical practice. Because I have so many patients with sensitivities, I just make sure I have a glycerin-free lubricant. So I encourage you to, to consider that because if you do pelvic exams and you've ever had patients say, oh my gosh, that burns, that stings, it's probably the glycerin and or parabens that's in that. So slippery stuff, um, Good Clean Love is a nice organic product line or, or semi-organic product line. Uh, Uber Lube for somebody that wants more of a silicone-based lubricant is a reasonable option. And um, the uh, Desert Harvest Aloe product line, they have, um, they've got a, a lubricant that has aloe in it. They also have one that has aloe and lidocaine for patients that have pain. Just encourage any lidocaine-based products, make sure they avoid like the clitoris and the areas that you want to maintain uh, a pleasurable sensation. And then I um, feel like I'm forgetting. There's, there's a lot of products out there, but those are probably the ones I hand out. You can get samples of all of those and hand those out so patients can kind of try them themselves. Perfect. Uh, are the Mona Lisa laser treatments still going on? Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what section that was related to. So. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that was related to the uh, postmenopausal dryness and pain. Uh, yes. Yeah, so there was a, gosh, when was that? Two years ago, I think it was that a big um, uh, kind of wrist slap came down from the FDA with the lasers and the uh, radio frequency devices. And it was kind of unfortunate because all the devices got lumped into one and some of them just had a wrist slap. Like I think the Mona Lisa company only had one infraction related to their marketing materials. I think there was a, something that they said in a marketing material that uh, was deemed inconsistent or, or not appropriate per the FDA. Whereas some of the other devices were actually deemed unsafe or unfit for human use. And so, uh, so a lot of them kind of fell by the wayside, but the Mona Lisa persists. It has 30 plus publications. There's actually ongoing clinical trials looking at it, not just for GSM or atrophic vaginitis, but also lichen sclerosis, vestibulitis, vulvodynia with really positive uh, data so far. So uh, I don't think unfortunately we'll ever see FDA approve uh, 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 CO2 fractional laser therapies, at least from this point that I can tell because the devices don't have CPT codes. And so there's no way to run it through insurance, even if it was technically approved. Now, maybe something will come along in the future, or maybe something will change with that. But the reason it's cash only in uh, most of these products, I think all of them are cash only, 
is because, um, uh, because there is no CPT code. Now, radio frequency is different. That's oftentimes used more so for like uh, uh, bladder incontinence and, you know, kind of like tightening and toning the vagina used oftentimes for vaginal rejuvenation. Uh, there's a lot of hoopla. That's a whole nother conversation about is it right? Is it wrong to do vaginal rejuvenation, whether it's surgical or through some of these therapies? Um, it's not endorsed. So vaginal rejuvenation is not endorsed through those mechanisms, through uh, various organizations, because we don't know lo the long-term data. And somebody just, I just noticed one popped up about Thermiva. Um, you know, there are publications on it. And so we know that there's a time and a place for using these products. Uh, but again, we just, we don't have like I know the Mona Lisa has extensive data. I'm pretty sure Thermova, I can't really speak too much to that, but I think they do have a substantial bit of published data. It's just not quite what the Mona Lisa has. Uh, so I encourage you, if you're considering looking into something like that, don't just listen to the reps, make sure you pull your own data and do a, a, a kind of look into it yourself. And then also ask colleagues, you know, colleagues that may be using these devices, have you had any complications? What do you think the efficacy is? before you make a decision about either referring out, for referring patients to have it done, or even including that in your own practice. Okay, thank you. We have one more question in the Q&A and then I have three additional from earlier. Okay. The last one, have you seen success with Restella? Are there any contraindications to the product aside from not using rose hip extract in women with breast cancer? Is there any evidence on testosterone replacement in women with BRCA mutations that have undergone BSO? And uh, would you keep that one up for me, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of pieces to that. Yes. So it's been success with Ristella. Yeah, I really like Ristella. I've had a lot of success with it. I've, I've uh, for my patients that want to be really aggressive with treating distressing low sex drive, I will have them use the Ristella with one of the CNS acting medications because uh, they're, they work differently. And the contraindications, I'm glad you asked about that because yeah, the rose hip extract, ideally patients with breast cancer, you wanna be uh, careful with that, of course, but also there's L-arginine in it. And so for individuals that, have, that carry the HSV virus or herpes virus that have um, common or frequent uh, genital herpes outbreaks, that can potentiate more frequent outbreaks. So the, the L-arginine triggers vasodilation and extra blood flow into the genitals, which again, can then trigger that virus. So it's not gonna obviously cause them to get HSV. It's not gonna cause any like worsening of the overall condition. However, they can have more frequent outbreaks. All they would do is simply stop it if that occurs. So I counsel my patients, some of them say, I don't wanna take the risk. I don't wanna have more frequent outbreaks. And other women say, okay, well, I'll just kind of pay attention. And if I feel like it's worsening, I'll either take, you know, Valtrex or something, or I'll just stop it. And, um, but one, going back to the efficacy of Ristella, it's been interesting. I actually have found that, um, this is my personal experience, my, my peri and postmenopausal women tend to do better with it. They just come back and really report positive response. Uh, it's kind of hit or miss when it comes to my younger patients, but I think it's because uh, younger patients, we know there's a, a huge component of the central nervous system that plays a role in distressing low sex drive. So hence why I might add it in with the CNS acting medication in a younger woman, but in my postmenopausal women, I really do push it a lot. And then is there any evidence on testosterone replacement in women with uh, BRCA mutations that have undergone a bilateral salping oophorectomy? Um, so good question. There's lots and lots and lots of data. Again, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Uh, but at this point, we don't really have any substantial data to show that there's any significant concern. You know, we worry about testosterone and, and its ability to aromatize into estrogen. We do know it's a, a much lower percentage than what it converts into as dihydrotestosterone. But at this point, there is really no concrete published evidence that says that there's a connection with testosterone use in women, especially when used appropriately, and, uh, and the concern for causing breast cancer or increasing the risk of breast cancer. Uh, I would certainly be cautious for what I do with my high-risk patients as I confer with their oncologist and we go through some of the data and usually we, we feel pretty comfortable unless they're in the midst of an early diagnosis or something like that. Uh, but testosterone is a, a, from the information that we have and the published data we have is very, very safe when used appropriately and monitored. Uh, the potential side effects that can occur, you know, hirsutism and acne, 
uh, moodiness, that sort of thing is usually only when it's abused and used at very high levels. So talking about some of those clinics, I've seen women that go get pellets at some of the clinics and they're not managed well. Uh, they receive way too much testosterone. They come to me and they're just riddled with acne. They've got hair growth all over their, their face and on their chin. And, uh, and they're really angry <laughs> because their testosterone is at a man's level. Um, but uh, when again, when used appropriately, we do know that it works. The reason we don't have an FDA approved testosterone for women in the US at this point is because um, the FDA basically said, okay, well, we've got you know five years of data on the intrinsic patch, which went up before the FDA a while back. They said, it looks safe, it looks effective. We want five more years, which would equate to about a billion dollars more worth of research. So all the companies in the US shut down. And unfortunately, we don't have any uh, really active trials at this moment on just plain testosterone in women. Uh, but we do have some products in other countries that are available. There's uh, compounding that's available to create creams and even commercially available products that are FDA approved for men that you can use a smaller amount. Women use about a 10th of what men use. So that was a very windy explanation for that question. I'll, I'll let you move on, Aspen. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Okay, we had, this one was submitted via email previously. So if a woman can't orgasm at all, what issues could it be? So if a woman, a woman can't orgasm at all, um, the question would be, was she able to in the past or has this been a lifelong issue? Um, that would be my first thing. If it's been lifelong, it may be that she isn't well-educated or she's not comfortable and there's inhibitory factors. I see a lot of women in Nashville that, uh, grow up very, very religious, and they're told sex is bad, 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 bad. And I shouldn't say religious, very um, strict upbringing, but oftentimes religion plays a role in it in my area. Um, but they're, they're essentially made to feel that sex is bad, and they shouldn't do it. And if they think about sexual thoughts or whatnot, um, that they're, they're dirty. And so they try to shut that aspect down. And I can't tell you how many women have come to me and said, but then I got married, and all of a sudden, this light switch is supposed to go off, and it's just supposed to go away. In that case, oftentimes I think about more inhibitory factors and I might refer to sex therapy. Sex therapy isn't just talk therapy, but it's focused, well, I should say it is talk therapy. There's, there's never nudity involved in that, but it's more so learning tricks and techniques specific to enhance a sexual encounter. So it's learning how to become orgasmic. Uh, there's lots of books out there, uh, Becoming Orgasmic, um, The Elusive Orgasm is a good one. And, um, and then for patients that maybe have lost the ability to orgasm, I think about nerve functioning, I think about blood flow, I think about, about the skin. So are they atrophic? Do they have inflammation? Have they had trauma to the skin? Um, and, uh, and just in general, hormonal influence, maybe they hit menopause and their testosterone dropped. Uh, and so all those potential factors can play a role. I oftentimes notice that women with orgasmic dysfunction have weak pelvic floor muscles. Orgasm is contraction and release of those muscles. And so if they have weakness or if they have tense muscles, they don't have the ability to relax, to contract. So either way, weakness or tension can lead to orgasmic dysfunction. Um, I would say probably the number one thing though is honestly just lack of, of education. Women are not oftentimes trained about pleasurable aspects of the genitals. And so it's just kind of explaining to them, you know, here is your clitoris. You know, there's lots of erogenous areas of your entire body. You know, let's talk through uh, methods that you can kind of try at home and they'll go home and, and respond back to me what worked, what didn't work. And oftentimes it's as simple as that. But if it isn't, we don't have any FDA approved treatments for orgasm. So that's when I bring in the physical therapy, arousal oils, that sort of thing. And, and uh, maybe even I'll use off-label medications to enhance libido, which if we think about you enhance dopamine, maybe using testosterone, maybe using a hormone-based vaginal cream, those are all things that can optimize the components that contribute to healthy orgasm. Okay, perfect. Um, two more. So do you have alternatives that you recommend um, to birth control pills for teens entering the age of sexual activity? So good alternatives. Mm -hmm. I have three daughters about to enter into that phase and it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and just to clarify, that question was related to, was it pills specifically or just birth control in general? It was alternative to pills. Yeah. Well, you know, there's progesterone only pills, which don't tend to have the same effect. Um, however, they're certainly not as effective against preventing pregnancy. And there's also the, the common side effect of spotting. There is the new progesterone uh, birth control, um, SLYND, S-L-Y-N-D, I believe. I unfortunately don't know a lot about it, but I've heard good things. 
Uh, there's a new ring called Anavera, which I mentioned at one point through the talk is A-N-N-O-V-E-R-A. Again, the progestin doesn't seem to be, uh, it, it seems to be neutral, no positive, no negative. So that's an option. However, young women may not be comfortable with a ring inside the vagina. Um, along that same line, I love IUDs, as I mentioned. I really like the Kylina IUDs, you know, some of the ones that are certainly more so designed for women who have never been pregnant. And if a younger girl, certainly probably not 13 or 14, but uh, maybe later teens or early 20s, it's a great, great approach for uh, minimizing their uh, menstrual cycles and also preventing pregnancy. Uh, I think for the, the younger gals, though, um, it is tricky when you really want to uh, minimize their, the heavy cycles and or potentially prevent pregnancy. It is, it's a tricky approach as to what to choose. And there's really no good solid answer to that. There's not one pill that is better than others. Um, we used to think that maybe one that was less androgenic would have less an effect, but it's really, it's not a big enough difference for women that are gonna be symptomatic of, um, you know, whether it's low sex drive or tissue thinning or whatever that may be, it's gonna happen one way or another with any of the pills. So I hate to be Debbie Downer with that, <laughs> but um, if they're capable of using the ring or, or tolerating the insertion of an IUD, that would be my choice. Okay, great. Um, and then last one is a comment and a question. So great presentation with fantastic information, um, but sometimes it's awkward or it can be to have these conversations with patients. So do you have advice on how to talk to patients or would you be willing to do like a follow-up presentation on approaching patients about sexual health and pelvic health issues? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's, uh, that's really covered well in some ISWISH courses. And actually, this is a great time to kind of look into that. If, if you're interested in learning more about how to approach patients, I'm certainly happy to, to, to present on that or discuss that. Uh, but the, the best people to teach us on that are the sex therapists, the psychotherapists, uh, which is, I mean, this is what they do is, you know, they do only talk therapy. And so they have really great techniques and approaches. Uh, one of the things to think about is the PLISSIT model. It's P-L-I-S-S-I-T. -S -S -I, I think that's right. But it's basically uh, uh, asking for permission, you know, providing limited inf uh, information. If you go through the PLISSIT model and you just type in Google PLISSIT and uh, sexual interview, I think it'll pop up and you can look at the information on that. But basically the way I approach my patients is I just, I walk into the room I acknowledge who I am. I tell them everything we talk about is confidential. And I try to just kind of, you know, have an icebreaker with them. I find that that really kind of helps them to relax a little bit. And then I just tell them, you know, I have a, a wonderful practice where I have extra time to spend with my patients. And it's tricky in a scenario where you have very limited time and other things to deal with. But I'll say, you know, I understand that you have some sexual concerns. Why don't you tell me about that? And if you can use open-ended questions, it gives them permission to go, oh, okay, this isn't a yes or no question. I can actually talk about my experience and I can't tell you how often patients thank me and just simply say, I'm so glad that somebody listened to me. And even if I don't have answers for them, that was so important for them just to have that therapeutic intervention where somebody hears them, they listen to them, they recognize this is a bothersome issue and, um, and I'm gonna try to help them as best I can. I think that's the most important. Okay, um, and that was all of our questions. So thank you. Do you have any uh Concluding thoughts? Well, I kind of got sidetracked as I was thinking through it, <laughs> talking earlier. Um, ISWISH is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, and they have um, a fall course that occurs every fall. Normally we get together, but like a lot of conferences, it was canceled, uh, or not canceled, but transitioned into a, a virtual course. It's every Friday, it started last Friday, but there's two more days. So next, this coming Friday, and then the following Friday, I think, what is it? The 10th is, today's Tuesday, uh, the 13th, is that right? 13th and the seventh, or I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> this Friday and next Friday. And I'm like, I don't know what month it is right now. But, um, but it's a great intro course for people that aren't, they don't consider themselves sex med experts. They're just wanting to kind of, dip their toe in and get a little bit of information. And they include a lot of, um, you know, questions about, or a content about how do you approach this? How do you bring this up? How do you initiate conversations? What type of questionnaires do you use? 
So I think that might be really, really helpful if you're interested and there's still time to sign up if you wanna do the virtual course. You can also access last Friday's information. Once you sign up, it'll just not be live, um, but the live courses are this Friday, next Friday. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks again. That was a fantastic presentation. This concludes this evening's webinar. Um, I would like to thank you to those who attended again.